So I'm, I'm Brett Frischman. I'm a uh, uh, physics and engineering study before I went to law school. Um, so I'm a lawyer, engineer, physics who pretends to be an economist. <laughs> but my, my story is actually very similar so, um, uh, to industrial engineering. So I, in, in engineering school, in graduate school, I took a bunch of courses in analytical decision making. Um, and so then when I went to law school and started looking at economics and law, economics seems straight, it just seemed like a natural fit, seemed like sort of an application of decision making. Uh, so it was sort of a natural thing to sort of fall into. So I've sort of, since then been thinking about environmental information, internet, and all kinds of common shared resources. Uh, sort of from a functional systems-based perspective, so it has a econ engineering perspective, um, but I do it from a, from a, from a law school. You remind me of the uh, Lynn Ostrom, uh, the late Lynn Ostrom, who in a beautiful interview of um, a good years ago, he was also explaining how her background was engineering, uh, technology, and technology. So it seems like people in this space tend to have a um, pretty good genius kind of background. I mean, it, sometimes people say some of, the, some, of the, some of the interesting insights that you get are when you actually combine people and you actually delve into some other uh, discipline because you bring a fresh angle. You're not uh, stuck with the paradigm that you've been taught in. It's, uh, and you know, she's a role model. I think that Oscar is sort of a role model for all of us. They approach problems. Well, I think we can, uh, after the, the usual 15 minutes, uh, Michael Corfield, uh, my co-director, has put down the wrong time in his, his calendar. It's coming, but it's going to be late, so let's start. So first of all, let, let me uh, thank uh, Professor Christian for accepting our invitation. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. And um, with no further ado, please, you can start here. Okay, great. Well, thanks for having me. It's, it's, it's a pleasure. It's, it's, uh, I think even just going around the room for a second, I can already tell there's tons of overlapping interests uh, with lots of the things you're doing and the things I talk about in the book, but also things I'm studying and researching outside. So it's, it's great. Uh, really an honor to be here. Uh, so as you all know, I just published this book with Oxford, and I'm uh, going to talk to you about it. And what I'm going to do is um, give sort of a relatively formal lecture about the book, um, and then, I, I, I don't know, I think it's 45 to 50 minutes or so, we said. And then after that, we'll have Q&A and just a discussion about anything you want to talk about. Um, but as I said in the beginning, if there's anything, as I'm talking, I mean, if it's too quick, if it's dense, if you have a question that you feel would help clarify or help you understand the concepts that I'm um, talking about, just feel free to intervene or raise your hand or let me know, and, and I'm happy to entertain you. That works best. OK. So, um, so too often, we take for granted the shared infrastructure that shape our lives, our relationships with each other, the opportunities we enjoy, uh, and the environment we share. So just think for a moment about the basic supporting infrastructures that you rely on daily. Right? So some obvious examples are roads, the internet, water systems, and the electric power grid. In fact, there are many less obvious examples, such as our shared languages, legal institutions, ideas, and even the atmosphere. We depend heavily on shared infrastructure, yet it's difficult to appreciate just how much these resources contribute to our lives. And it's difficult because infrastructure resources are complex, and the benefits that they provide are typically indirect. Both governments and markets struggle to adequately supply the public with the infrastructures that it needs. Infrastructures require, often require substantial investment to supply, to maintain, to manage, and the investment must come from somewhere. The public must pay one way or another. Simply put, there are a host of supply-side obstacles to efficient infrastructure provision. An economic analysis of infrastructure tends to focus on these issues. But one critical reason which is generally overlooked, and which I confront at length in this book, uh, is that infrastructure users, both as voters and as consumers, may not adequately reflect or signal social demand for the infrastructures they use. In other words, there are a host of demand side issues to confront. 
So infrastructure resources are at the center of many contentious public policy debates, ranging from what to do about our crumbling roads and bridges, to whether and how to protect the natural environment, to patent law reform, to spectrum allocation, to energy policy, to network neutrality regulation in the future of the internet. The list could go on and on. Although the policy arenas may seem unrelated, all of them are to some extent the same. Each of the policy debates involves a battle to control infrastructure, to set the terms and conditions under which the public gets access, and to determine how the infrastructure and the infrastructure-dependent systems evolve over time. So the battle is joined in each of these areas, with some groups arguing strongly for recourse to private property solutions, and other groups arguing strongly that such an approach would be fatal. The groups draw on a broader intellectual debate that takes place in a number of fields, fields that actually many of the people in this room <coughs> cover in economics, in law, in engineering, and in political science. On the private control side, there's a robust economic theory in support of private ordering via markets with minimal government intervention. By contrast, on the open access side, there's a frequent call for protecting the commons. But the theoretical support for this prescriptive call is underdeveloped from an economics perspective. So I fill this gap and advance strong economic arguments for managing and sustaining infrastructure as commons. So in the first three parts, so this is maybe hard to see, but don't worry, just to give you an overview. The first three parts of the book develop a general theoretical framework for examining the social value of shared infrastructure. The framework is not tailored to any particular type of infrastructure. Instead, it's based on a functional <coughs> economic analysis of the characteristics of infrastructure resources and various resource management institutions. In the final three parts of the book, I apply the framework to many different types of infrastructure exploring nuanced trade-offs that arise in particular contexts, as well as common themes or issues that cut across different contexts. So despite their obvious differences, road systems, telephone networks, ecosystems, and ideas, and I must say, in the internet too, given where we are, uh, they have much more in common than is conventionally appreciated. So here's what I plan to do today. I'll briefly provide some background to help explain why I'm bringing together infrastructure on one hand and commons on the other, two concepts that aren't ordinarily uh, merged. Then I want to focus on the heart of the book, which is really chapters four and five, in which I develop the framework for identifying infrastructural resources and evaluating the, ca the case for commons management. And then finally, I will turn to the highly contentious network neutrality debate, a debate that's been active in the United States for at least a decade, that's starting to surface, uh, I think, quite a bit in Europe. The Dutch just passed a law that has a network neutrality rules in it. Uh, someone was telling me right before we started that the uh, European Commissioner, I think, brought up net neutrality, is that right, recently? <coughs> and said we don't need it, but it's going to be a debate that you're going to see in Europe, I think, as well. So I'm going to make a few controversial arguments about both the debate, and uh, I'm also going to uh, suggest a rather strong and controversial network neutrality rule. Okay. So, infrastructure, the word infrastructure, the term, the concept, generally conjures up the notion in your mind of a large-scale physical resource made by humans for public consumption. Right, so some familiar examples include transportation systems or communication systems or public you know, basic public services and facilities. Right? We can expand the list considerably. But let's consider three generalizations about though, even those traditional types of infrastructure. The first is that the government has played and continues to play a significant and widely accepted role in ensuring the provision of many different types of infrastructure. In many contexts, Private parties and markets certainly play an increasingly important role. But nonetheless, the government's role as a provider, subsidizer, coordinator, or regulator, traditional infrastructure provision remains intact 
in most communities throughout the world. Right? And the reason is that left alone, infrastructure markets often fail. And they fail in many different ways. And we're going to talk about that. Second observation is that traditional infrastructure generally are managed as commons. In short, the resource is accessible to all within a community, regardless of who you are or what you're planning to do. Access to and use of most infrastructure resources are not prioritized based on such criteria, except in very special cases, right? Like the, the narrowly defined priority given to a police officer driving with her siren blaring and the lights on, right? No, importantly, that priority is not for sale, except in Russia, but put that aside for now. Okay. In general, you can't buy, buy priority on most traditional infrastructure resources, okay? Third point, right? Traditional infrastructure are understood to generate significant spillovers that result in large social gains. Most economists agree that infrastructure generate large social gains above the, uh, what markets, uh, what the market value. Okay? Um, now, there's plenty of debates about which infrastructure to focus on and which infrastructure are incrementally better in different contexts, but the general proposition is pretty well accepted. Okay? Um, now, most economists recognize that infrastructure are important to society precisely because they give rise to large social gains. Right? Now, the nature of those gains yeah. So the nature of those gains as spillovers or as positive externality, positive third party effects, may explain why in general we take infrastructure for granted. Right? The externalities are sufficiently difficult to observe or measure quantitatively, much less to capture in economic transactions. And the benefits are, sufficient, are diffuse and sufficiently small in magnitude to escape the attention of individual beneficiaries on a regular basis. So one of the central objectives of the book is to explore the relationship, I'm sorry, between these three generalizations. They're not always true, but these three generalizations, why, why, why do we observe them in practice? What's their relationship? Okay, so before delving deeper, I want to briefly explain what I mean by uh, commons management. Uh, the term commons generally conjures up the notion of a shared community resource, like a public park or a common pasture. While often associated with Garrett Hardin's article, The Tragedy of the Commons, one should not assume tragedy. Right, so when I say commons, you should not think tragedy. Break that association in your mind. I think here that's not going to be hard to do, but try. Teach that to others. Right? So in the book, I adopt a functional approach to understanding commons. Commons can be understood as a resource management strategy. Right? Commons is not, is not the resource itself. It's the way in which we manage or govern the resource. Okay? So I use the term carefully. I say commons management refers to the situation in which a resource is accessible to all members of a community on non-discriminatory terms specifically meaning terms that do not depend upon the user's identity or intended use. In short, non-discriminatory sharing. For most public infrastructure, the relevant community is the public at large. Okay. Now, at times, people overstate or, uh, or get confused about my thesis, the argument I'm really making in this book. Right? And they, they sum it up in a catchphrase. If infrastructure, then commons. That's what Fishman says. And I want to be very clear, that is not the argument. That's not what I say. That's not the thesis. Okay. Instead, it's, it's the structure of the argument. Right? It's an organizing principle. So chapter four focuses on infrastructure as a type of resource. It defines it as a, as a set of resources that we can identify. Chapter five focuses on commons management as a type of resource management strategy which can be pursued privately or publicly, okay? So if a resource satisfies the criteria set forth in chapter four and it qualifies as infrastructure, then the arguments for and against commons management need to be carefully examined. So let's turn our attention to the, uh, to the question of what qualifies as infrastructure, okay? 
So infrastructure satisfied in this book, in my mind, these, these three criteria. Uh, and at the outset, I'll say, this is both an under-inclusive and over-inclusive definition relative to what lots of people conventionally think. So an oil reserve is not infrastructure, according to this theory, right? because it's widely received consumed. Um, but things like ideas are. And many people think that an idea is not infrastructure, because it's, uh, or they think that, uh, well, they think an idea is not infrastructure. And I would say they, they can't. OK, so the resources consumed unrivalously. Demand, social demand for the resources is driven by productive activity of users, so it's an input. I'm going to explain each of these three more carefully as we go forward. And third, the resources used as an input to a wide range of goods and services, right? Private, public, and social goods. So infrastructural resources are either pure or impure public goods. Okay? Non-rivalry over some appreciable range of demand opens the door to widespread shared access and productive use of the resource. Okay? So for purely non-rival resources, the marginal cost of allowing an additional person to access the, and use the resource is zero over all demand. Right? That's a pure public good. Infinite capacity uh, for shared use. Partially non-rival resources have finite but potentially renewable and potentially shareable capacity. So what that means is that the marginal cost of allowing an additional person to use the resource is zero over some range of demand, but not necessarily over the entire range of demand, right? The resource is congestible, but it's not necessarily congested. Don't assume it is, right? Don't assume tragedy, just like the tragedy that comes, okay? Sharing is feasible, for these resources, but not necessarily costless. It depends upon the contextual details, like how the resource is managed, the number of users, the available capacity, and so on. Okay? So in short, the first criteria describes the shareable nature of the resource. Sharing is technologically feasible. Infrastructure resources can be used concurrently by multiple users for multiple uses. And this presents an important, though often overlooked, and underappreciated opportunity. Non-rivalry can be leveraged for a variety of purposes. Now the second and third criteria, right, they focus on the manner in which the infrastructure creates social value. In a sense, on how non-rivalry can be leveraged. These criteria move us beyond the public goods classification and raise additional demand side Consider, uh, implication and consideration. So in other words, we're talking about a special type of public good, and it's special because in the ways that the second and third criteria help us to identify. Okay? Infrastructure resources are capital goods. So they're not just public goods, they're public capital goods. Right? They create social value when used productively. Societal demand is always derived demand, derived from the things that users are doing. So whether we're talking about transportation systems, the electricity grid, ideas, environmental <coughs> ecosystems, internet infrastructure, the bulk of the social benefits generated by each of these resources derives from their downstream use, it derives from what users are doing when they gain access to and make use of these resources. Okay? The third criterion emphasizes both the variance of what people can do, the variance of those downstream activities and outputs, and the nature of those outputs. Right? So infrastructure are generic or general purpose inputs, and the range of outputs can span private, public, and social goods. So critically, infrastructure are not special purpose resources optimized for a particular use or a particular user or a particular market. Instead, they provide basic multi-purpose functionality. So an electricity grid, for example, delivers power to the public supporting an incredibly wide variety of uses, users, markets, and technologies. It's not specially designed or optimized for a particular use or a particular user or a particular market, particular technology. It provides non-discriminatory service for a toaster and a computer, for staples and a pizzeria, and the same can be said for the highway system or for the internet. 
These resources provide basic functionalities and thereby support and structure more complex systems of user activities, but critically, they do not determine them. Users determine what to do with the capabilities that infrastructure provide. Infrastructure uh, uh, provide a range of capabilities that we'll talk about. So genericness implies a range of capabilities, of options, of opportunities, or choices, and freedoms for users. Users decide what roads to travel, where to go, what to do, who to visit. Users choose their activities. They can choose to experiment, to innovate, to roam freely. They get to decide whether and what to build, how to use their time and other complementary resources. So to understand societal demand and how value is created and realized, we need to pay closer attention to the nature of the user activities and the outputs that they produce. And that's why the third criterion emphasizes the nature of those outputs and more specifically, the potential production of public and social goods. Oop, I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. Um, so when infrastructure supports these productive activities, there's good reasons to question how well markets will work in assessing demand and supplying infrastructure. Okay? So a gap between private demand and social demand arises because the social value created when users produce public and social goods is underrepresented in the prices that people are willing to pay for infrastructure. And the social value be, can be ex substantial but incredibly difficult to measure. Now the reason for the gap is relatively straightforward. Just the reason for there being a gap, I'll talk a little bit more about the shapes of the curves in a few minutes, but the reason for a gap is straightforward. Infrastructure users' willingness to pay reflects their private demand. What that means is it's the value they expect to realize. And it doesn't take into account the value that others might realize, third parties might realize, as a result of their use. That is, it doesn't take into account the external effects associated with producing public or social goods. Okay? So difficulties in measuring and appropriating value generated in output markets translates into a problem for infrastructure suppliers and consequently the public. I talk about this as a demand manifestation problem that can affect infrastructure allocation, design, investment, and management. So in the book, I develop a typology of different infrastructure based on the different activities downstream. And it really aims to help sort out the arguments. It delineates three, I delineate three types of infrastructure. I call them commercial, public, and social. Well, you can certainly imagine other types. This is just to help organize the kinds of market values we might be concerned with. Sorry, I didn't understand exactly what is the green line. Yeah. The green line? Yeah. The green. Uh, so the green is no different than the red. Right. Okay. Right? They're the both, end. the green, the red, the pink, uh, the green, red, and pink are all social demand curves. I will come back to this in about okay. three or four slides okay. and I'll explain okay. why I've got a wavy, crazy looking curve as opposed to just a linear one. Okay. Thanks. Okay. But yes, they're, they're both social demand curves. The blue one's the only private thing. Thanks for asking. Great. Um, okay, so commercial infrastructure, right? They support the production of a wide variety of private goods. Public, public, social, social. You can kind of see how the typology works. For commercial infrastructure, the conventional economic analysis applies and works rather well, right? The focus, as I said in the beginning, is on the supply side. Consumers are largely passive in the analysis. Right? Because the outputs are private goods, there are no externality problems associated with public or social goods, and so demand manifestation problems are not significant. Okay? But for both public and social infrastructure, demand manifestation problems can be quite significant. Okay? Infrastructure users, that, again, that produce public and social goods suffer from valuation problems because they don't fully observe, much less capture, uh, the benefits that they generate from their outputs. And this could lead them to not accurately represent societal demand for infrastructure. Right. In other words, society may want, need, or depend upon infrastructure use to a substantial degree more than private demand would suggest. And this gives rise to two sets of related social or market failure concerns. 
Okay? The first are concerns about undersupply and underuse of infrastructure. And the, and the undersupply of infrastructure dependence, public and social goods. And the second set of concerns are about the dynamic shifts in the nature of infrastructure resources <laughs> over time. That is, infrastructure development being skewed in socially undesirable directions over time. These concerns can be understood if you return to those two curves we had up a second ago, private and social demand curve. Oh, so uh, we'll skip that. Okay? So the private demand curve reflects users' willingness to pay, and it effectively ranks individual uses according to private value from left to right. This is the blue curve in both uh, uh, figures. For now, focus on the, the figure on the left. Okay? The social demand curve is a demand curve that's shifted up. It could be down if we're talking about negative externalities or harms. Right? But it's a demand curve that's shifted up or down from the private demand curve to reflect the aggregate spillovers or externalities that comprise the difference between social and private value. Now there's a temptation. I felt this temptation for a, long, for a few years when I was working on this. There's a temptation to draw a social demand curve with the same shape as the product demand curve, that is drawing the red line on the left. Okay? Um, doing so assumes that each user generates an identical spillover, at least in terms of its magnitude. This assumption is completely inappropriate. Right? It may be the case that willingness to pay and magnitude of the externality are correlated in some contexts, but there's absolutely no reason a priori to assume such a correlation. And making such an assumption can be incredibly misleading. It can distort your analysis. Right? The shape of the social demand curve may diverge substantially from that of the, of the private demand curve because there's no necessary or obvious relationship between private and social value of different users' use of the infrastructure. Okay? So we can take the argument a step further and construct demand curves based on infrastructure uses. Okay? or activities, or even markets, based on the aggregated demand for different uses. And so this allows us uh, to construct the, the diagrams on the right and to focus on variance among different uses. So for public and social infrastructure, the private and social demand curves likely are quite different. Okay. So let's consider two ways in which divergences might arise. That is, differences in the gaps between private and social Okay, so first, social surplus, or the amount by which social value exceeds private value for a particular use of it, right? it might be driven by the magnitude of the size of the external effect generated by a particular public good. Right? So there may be some infrastructure-enabled activity, use, or application that generates substantial spillovers by virtue of the nature of the public good or social good produced. So think of the killer app. Right? Now, it can be very difficult, if not impossible, to predict what activities, uses, or applications will turn out to be so valuable. Okay? Second, social surplus, or the difference between the curves, might derive from a large number of outputs that generate spillovers on a much smaller scale. So in this case, it's not the magnitude of the effect from a particular good that drives the analysis. It's the number of users participating in this particular type of use or activity, right? And the, and the, generate, and the number of goods that they produce as they participate in this activity. So in other words, small scale externalities can add up to a significant social surplus. I think this is a very significant addition to the literature that's not uh, taken into account very much at all. So let me give you a, a relatively simple illustration. Here's an example all of you will be familiar with and I hope it sort of helps make the point. All right, so who knows about this, this uh, uh, website called YouTube? Everybody does, right? So YouTube videos provide a relatively simple illustration of both the small scale and the killer app phenomenon. Um, and so they help illustrate the point. So YouTube's a video sharing platform made possible by the app. You can also get different video sharing platforms or different platforms. The last chapter of the book talks, about, or the second to last chapter talks about a bunch of so most videos on YouTube are intended for a small audience. But many probably reach a slightly larger audience. Right? So for example, suppose I post a, uh, a video of my, my three boys singing and dancing. They're very cute. They can't sing very well, but it, it could be pretty funny. Right? I send a link to my family and friends. 
expecting that the video will be viewed by, let's say, 25 people. Okay? Perhaps 100 people actually visit, watch, and enjoy. This would generate small-scale spillovers to 75 extra people. I don't know the magnitude, but I know that 75 people watching the full video from beginning to end, that's, that's extra value for some magnitude. Right? So while YouTube might capture some of the benefits of advertising, they certainly don't capture it all, at all. And the, benefit, the, key, the, the key point is the benefits are irrelevant to my own decision to create or post the, the video, right? the public good that I've shared. Now, the benefits are incidental, and they might seem like small potatoes. They may seem like insignificant. But they add up when, mil when you consider the fact that millions of people engage in this activity on a regular basis, maybe even daily. As you may know, every once in a while, maybe each week, a user-generated video uh, attracts millions of viewers and becomes a cultural phenomenon. So in 2007, for example, Howard Davies Carr posted a video of his two boys, Harry and Charlie, titled Charlie Bit My Finger Again. How many of you have seen the video? No one's seen it. Okay. So I should put it on and show it. I figured everyone would have seen it. Um, apparently, you're, you're one of them that are in the group of 280, 300 million people who've seen it. So apparently, the video was intended for just one person, the boy's godfather in the United States. Unexpectedly, the video went viral and has been viewed over 280 million times. That video generated enormous spoilers. Social value above and beyond what the poster possibly could have anticipated or is capable of appropriating. Critically, neither the government nor the market would have selected that video ex ante and funded the producer. The bottom line, in the the point of this illustration right, is that an open video sharing platform provides users with a basic capability. It keeps social options open. When users choose to exercise that capability, they presumably do so because it, it satisfies their own self-interest sufficiently, right? And at the same time, they incidentally generate spillovers because they share a public good. Now, I've described two extremes. At one end, a particularly valuable public or social good output generates a large social surplus. And at the other end, a large number of public or social goods generate small social surpluses. surpluses right? Of course, there's a middle ground as well. Right? My point is to, is to illustrate the many different ways in which value is created, but it's hard for us to quantify and observe. Okay? I also want to note that YouTube itself is just a simple example. This phenomena of open infrastructure supporting the generation of small-scale externalities because of activities that are widespread and killer app phenomena is actually more, is a very common phenomenon. Right? It's not just YouTube. You find it over and over again. And that's much of what the book is about. Okay. Now you might wonder, isn't there a simple economic solution to this concern about producing public goods? Right? Economists have long recognized there's a case for subsidizing public goods producers, because the market undersupplies these things. We understand that. Right? But the effectiveness of directly subsidizing producers of public goods will vary considerably, based on, among other things, the capacity of subsidy mechanisms to identify and direct funds to worthy recipients. Government has to assess demand and figure out which public and social goods are worth supporting. There are significant, well-understood limitations on the capacity resources and effectiveness of government in this regard. Of course, certain types of public goods and social goods may be well funded, particularly those that are that have politically powerful opponents or promise to deliver returns in the short term. But many, 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 many are not. Right? The substantial variety of users and uses generating public and social goods makes this quite difficult. So in many cases, it may be better to focus on infrastructure as an indirect means of supporting public and social goods producers. I'm going to return to this point shortly, but first I want to make uh, briefly talk about the second set of market value concerns, the more dynamic ones. So these are concerns about dynamic failures in infrastructure markets uh, and how private infrastructure providers manage the evolution of infrastructure over time. So to the extent that infrastructure resources can be optimized or prioritized by design, 
for particular applications. You can imagine the infrastructure owner focusing on the activities of the output markets to the left side of the diagram, right? Because that's where those, those markets exist and the markets that values appropriately, right? Um, but there, there's a risk that suppliers will do that, that they'll favor applications that generate more readily appropriate benefits. This bias towards infrastructure uses that generate appropriate value is a direct, predictable, and quite natural consequence of the ordinary operation of the market system. So to be very clear, this is a feature, not a bug, of the market system. We expect and encourage firms, entrepreneurs, and other market participants to behave in this fashion. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not morally reprehensible. There's nothing wrong with focusing on markets or uses or activities where you can actually uh, increase your returns. When feasible, firms manage infrastructure evolution, for example, through prioritization of investments, design choices, access to various user <coughs> communities, where to build, for example, decisions. Right? And they're going to do so based uh, on maximizing expected value to the firm, not to society. So it shouldn't be surprising or controversial that profit potential often will be a significant driver of evolution within infrastructure markets. Second, there's a risk that infrastructure suppliers are going to favor applications or uses or markets that currently exist or are anticipated to exist with a reasonable degree of certainty over those that are more uncertain or even unknown. That's a prospective uncertainty in various dimensions can steer managers towards the known or the reasonably foreseeable set of uses or markets. Biasing, design, investment, development, or licensing methods. And as a result, firms may find themselves prematurely locked in to developing paths or technologies or business models or even just mindsets. Technological design is one way to optimize or choose a path, but prioritization of user activities coupled with discriminatory pricing is simply another way. Right, so thus far, what I've given to you is I've given you a snapshot of chapter four, the kinds of market failure problems that arise in the demand side when we're talking about public and social infrastructure. Um, I'm going to want to move over to chapter five and just very briefly talk about commons management before I move on to that neutrality discussion. Okay, so commons management or non-discrimination rules of various types can be, an, it can be an attractive private or public management strategy. There are, so in other words, there are a variety of reasons why the private firms choose to manage their infrastructure as a commons. I discuss those in the book. I'm not going to discuss them today if we don't have time. Instead, I want to focus on commons management as a public strategy or a government strategy. Um, and in the book, I also discuss the conventional economic case for non-discrimination rules as a public strategy, right? So there's different types, open access regulation, the central facilities doctrine, or maybe an antitrust law, uh, or common carrier style rules. And again, I'm not going to talk about those in this talk either. I'm happy to talk about them in Q&A if you're interested. Uh, suffice it to say that the conventional economic analysis is rooted in antitrust and regulatory economics and pays insufficient attention to the demand side arguments that I articulated in so what my argument is, what I do in the book, is I argue that commons management can be an efficient means to indirectly support public participation in a variety of socially valuable activities, namely those that involve the production, use, and distribution of public and social goods. So managing infrastructure as a commons can be a more effective, albeit blunt, means for supporting the production of public and social goods than targeted subsidies. Now, critically, commons management is not in itself a direct subsidy, but it effectively creates cross-subsidies and eliminates the need to rely on either the market or the government to pick winners. The inefficiencies, information problems, and transaction costs, not to mention public choice problems, associated with picking winners under either of those systems can justify managing public and social infrastructure as a in addition, managing these type of infrastructures and commons has important dynamic implications, apart from cross-subsidies. So commons management maintains flexibility in the generic nature of the, of the infrastructure, and thus addresses persistent and systematic uncertainty about which uses or users will generate social value in the future. 
Um, and, we can, and the book I talk about this in terms of a, what I think is a new idea, it's sort of looking at it through option theory, developing the idea of a social option. There's high uncertainty regarding users or uses that generate social value as, a, as opposed to private. Okay, so I want to move on to the example of, of, of net neutrality, um, but I do want to make clear that the book, there are a variety of complications and counter arguments. Right? I'm just trying to identify an argument that's missed, right? an area that we need to, that, that I want to focus attention on. But there are compl complications and counter arguments. In chapter 6, 7, and 8 of the book, I analyze a, a, a number of these, including uh, the impact on infrastructure pricing, supply side incentives to invest, and congestion management. So let me leave those issues, issues aside for now. I'm happy to talk about them in the Q&A. Uh, and I want to move on to the network neutrality uh, discussion. Now, net neutrality is a, is a hot topic in the United States. Uh, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, uh, uh, created a rule uh, that implements an open internet rule, which implements a version of network neutrality that's being challenged at the, at the DC Circuit Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C. People will say that it's going to be a danger to predict outcomes of cases. My guess is that it will get struck down, in which case we'll be having this debate again in the United States for the next five or 10 years. Right? It's surfacing in Europe, as I think I mentioned at the beginning, the, the Dutch government uh, passed legislation in, in implementing network neutrality rules. And the European Commissioner suggested that the EC level at least maybe more broadly, you know, that we don't need network neutrality and things are fine. So I suspect it will heat up as it may appear as well. Okay. So this is just the outline of the chapter. I'm not going to talk about all of this, but just to give you a sense of structure of some of the things I go into and probably highlights the things that I don't do. Alright, so the internet has grown to become an integral part of our society, our economy, and our daily lives. Right? So in addition to growth in that electronic commerce and innovations unimaginable only two decades ago, the internet's radically incre increased entrepreneurship, political discourse, the production and consumption of media, social network formation, community building, among many other things. It's important to understand, I think, how the internet generates social value. What makes the internet truly valuable to society? It's important to understand how the internet uh, infrastructure supports widespread user participation in an incredibly diverse range of productive activities. It's important to understand how managing the internet infrastructure as a commons sustains what I call a spillover-rich environment, an environment within which users are generating public and social goods and lots of spillovers that flow across users on the net as well as flowing off the net. Okay, so there are many internet policy debates involving infrastructure. For example, we could debate, we talk about the domain name system or spectrum allocation. But in the book, and here I focus on the network neutrality debate. And the heart of this debate is whether the internet infrastructure itself will continue to be managed as a commons. Ultimately, the outcome of the debate may very well determine whether the internet continues to operate as a mixed infrastructure. By mixed infrastructure, I mean one that, generally, that supports widespread production of private, public, and social goods. Okay. And whether it continues to be that, a mixed infrastructure, whether it evolves into a commercial infrastructure optimized for the production and delivery of commercial outputs to capacity. So you are all, this uh, will come through very well uh, on the slide, but you are all probably familiar with different layered models of the internet, right? And this is a, a five-layered model, physical, logical, infrastructure, and applications content uh, sitting on top. Social, the social layer being something that's recently people are talking a lot about. I think it actually makes sense to think about social relations, uh, social capital formation as an additional and separate layer. Right? It actually spills offline as well as online. So the current internet infrastructure evolved with the end-to-end -end design principle as a central tenet. Right? The broad version of this design principle, which if you're actually interested in reading more and more about this, Barbara Van Sherrick's book goes into incredible detail about this, it's great. Um, we co-authored an article that talked about this some too. Uh, the, the broad version of the design principle, as you probably know, recommends that the lower layers of the network be as general as possible. 
while application-specific functionality should be concentrated in higher layers at the end hosts. Right? So end-to-end -end design sustains an infrastructure commons by insulating end users from market-driven restrictions on access and use of the infrastructure. So if infrastructure providers, right, particularly physical infrastructure providers at the bottom layer, right, if they follow end-to-end -end principles, sort of implemented in TCPIP, for example, they cannot distinguish between end uses, they cannot base access decisions or pricing on how packets may be used, nor can they optimize the infrastructure or their networks for particular classes of end uses. Of course, I'm sure as all of you know, there's considerable pressure for change. The pressure comes from many sources, including the internet's evolution from, any, from narrow band to broadband, rapid increase in users, demand for latency sensitive and jitter sensitive applications such as massively multiplayer online games, IP telephony, demand for security and spam uh, uh, measures uh, implemented at the core of the internet rather than the ends, as well as uh, copyright enforcement is another way to add that. And of course, demand for increased returns on infrastructure investments. In response to these pressures, these demands to deviate from end to end, technology has become available that enables network owners to look at packets traveling across the networks, to determine the application of the web page they belong to, affect and affect the transport of the packets based on that information. And of course, there are many other, this is the you know, key packet inspection, again, I think you all probably know about it. Uh, but there are many other methods for getting around end-to-end -end design and identifying users or uses. Right? So for example, access providers routinely monitor traffic and use pattern recognition and other techniques to identify uses. So for example, identify packets using email and telephony and peer-to-peer -peer applications. Right? And it's really these developments, the developments of these technologies and methods that allow for deviation from end-to-end -end as a norm, that has given rise to the next technology today. So the central issue, at least as I see it, in the network neutrality debate, uh, is whether, and if so, how government regulation should disable the ability of network providers to discriminate among uses or users of the internet. Okay? So let me, uh, let me highlight a few ways in which the current debate, both the academic and research debate, as well as the policy debate uh, about network neutrality uh, is misframed and I would argue distorted. Okay. Um, all right. For time, I think I'm going to skip over the, the notion of neutrality. And neutrality is, is a word that's stuck for 10 years, um, but I think most people by now recognize there's no such thing as neutrality. You're talking about different kinds of biases in the system. Right? Either you're going to have, uh, I mean, end to end has its own bias, it has a bias against those things that would benefit from having prioritization, or you can have a bias. Uh, uh, that the, uh, against things that, that within, uh, if you move to a prioritized network, you'll have the kinds of market bias, market-driven biases that I talked about a few minutes ago. If there's a choice between what kind of internet environment we want to structure, biases are going to be there. There's, neutrality is almost sort of a fictional uh, rhetorical term, at least in my view. Okay? But I still use it, right? Because that's what the, how the debate is described. Okay, so how is the debate misframed? Well, at least in the United States, and you all have to tell me if this is true over here as well, right? at least in the United States, the network neutrality debate has been hijacked. It's been hijacked by antitrust and regulatory economics with highly distorting consequences. Okay? So antitrust and regulatory economics suggest that government intervention is only needed when markets are not competitive, and that even when markets are not competitive, Internet uh, government intervention is only justified in very narrow circumstances when demonstrable harm to consumers in the relevant markets can be shown and not outweighed by efficiency benefits. Okay. Now, uh, in my view, the focus on competition and demonstrable harm to consumers is completely misguided. Here I'm, being, I'm, I'm out on a limb here because this is not necessarily the conventional view. Okay? 
In my view, the focus on competition and demonstrable harm to consumers distorts the debate dramatically and distracts participants from the more important fundamental question, which is what type of internet environment our society demands. Okay. So let me highlight three ways in which the distortions are right. so the three uh, that are mentioned there uh, on the slide. Okay. So first, the antitrust and regulatory economics framework views the internet as a mere supply chain. Right? Just a series of complete markets, things being supplied you know, in, a, in a sequence. Okay? Now there are more sophisticated versions of the supply chain view, and they incorporate something called two-sided markets, where economists put networks in between applications and content providers on one side and consumers on the other, and then they consider how networks will be able to efficiently mediate transactions on each side of the market. Okay? One way or another, an incredibly complex open system is reduced to an inappropriately simple closed system for purposes of analysis, evaluation, and policy making. The simple supply chain view assumes complete markets and it ignores incomplete and missing markets, externalities from public and social goods. Despite the prevalence in the actual internet environment that we encounter daily, right? The slightly more sophisticated two-sided market view, it might incorporate some incomplete markets, but only where the relevant externalities within, are within the closed system of markets that are being considered. That is, when the external effects are effects on one side or the other of the mediated market. Okay? This is convenient because it allows modelers to examine whether the intermediary will set prices efficiently. But, it assumes away the externalities associated with the production, sharing, use, and reuse of public and social goods that are felt outside of the closed system. It also fails to appreciate the complexity associated with the, the bare fact that the internet involves many interdependent, many-sided markets and non-markets. Okay? Second, the antitrust and regulatory economics framework leads to misconceptions of the actors that are involved. Specifically, it creates a false distinction between application and content providers and, the other, and other end users. So it understates the role of users as producers. Now, users produce a wide range of private, public, and social goods on the internet, including various applications and content. Google is an end user, just like you and me, or anyone else. Now, of course, we're all we're different in some ways. So, for example, in the amount of traffic or revenue we generate, but not necessarily in a way that matters or should matter for the network neutrality debate. I, you, or anyone else in this room could be the next Google, and that's a great thing. We shouldn't reduce users to passive consumers and think of them as distinct from the application of content providers. Okay, final uh, distortion, the debate is fixated on competition red pairing. Okay. So competition policy seems to be the fulcrum of the debate. Right? It's the thing on which the debate hinges, goes one direction or the other. Okay. In the sense that the debate largely revolves around whether network owners have market power in the first place and whether discrimination among data packets would cause anti-competitive effects. Now the focus on competition is misguided, in my view, because it distorts the debate by ignoring the demand side issues. Essentially by assuming private demand reflects and reflected in markets fully reflects societal demand. Right? So critically, even if we assume we have robust competition in infrastructure markets. Now, that is a heroic assumption. It's not one I believe in, but let's just assume it to be true. Okay? I argue the case for network neutrality remains strong. Okay? Competition alone does not alleviate the demand side concerns. Competition does not ensure an efficient allocation of resources. Competition does not assure us that the internet environment that we will have
have an internet environment that maximizes social welfare. Now look, competition does not address these interests for essentially the same reason that antitrust law is orthogonal to environmental law, meaning they, they just, they, they're like this. Environmental law, antitrust law, they just don't address the same issues, okay? Antitrust law does not address market failures associated with externalities, whether environmental pollution, like negative externalities, or the production sharing and productive reuse of public and social goods involving positive externalities. Indeed, it is well established in economics that competitive markets overproduce pollution and underproduce public and social goods. So as I've discussed, the conventional economic solutions to the underproduction of public and social goods uh, do not work very well in this context because of the incredible variety of both producers of public and social goods as well as varieties of public and social goods themselves. And thus the predictable failure of government in choosing how to direct subsidies <coughs> in this environment. So in my view, the network neutrality debate is and must be complicated. It shouldn't be reduced to a competition policy framework. Right? We need to grapple with the demand side issue. What is the environment and the infrastructure that we demand? The internet currently is a mixed infrastructure. It enables the production of a wide variety of private, public, and social goods. Now the supply chain view captures the commercial nature of the internet reasonably well. Applications and content providers do use the internet as a means to engage in a host of commercial transactions with passive consumers. And so without a doubt, uh, without a doubt the value of the internet as commercial infrastructure is immense, huge, very important. Yet, the value of the internet as public and social infrastructure dwarfs its value as commercial infrastructure. Okay, so I recognize this is an incredibly difficult claim to substantiate with empirical data that purports to measure value. That's fine. I think we have to live with that. Measuring spillovers is hard. Ignoring them is worse. Okay? Consider what makes the internet valuable to society. Think about it. Really think, really think about what makes it valuable to society, like what makes it so valuable. The internet's value to society, in my view, is tied to the range of capabilities it provides to individuals, firms, households, governments, and other organizations to interact with each other and to participate in various activities and social systems. It's very difficult to estimate the full social value of the internet in large part because of the wide variety of user activities and interactions that generate public and social goods. Despite the difficulty, we know the internet is transforming society. Right? Commerce, community, culture, education, government, health, politics, and science are all information and communications intensive systems that the internet is transforming. The transformation is taking place at the ends, where people are empowered to participate and to be engaged. In the book, I provide an extension discussion of the different kinds of activities and the ranges of public and, and social goods. And I argue that the demand side case for managing the internet as a commons is quite strong. Now, I do think that the case for managing the uh, infrastructure as a commons is strong as a matter of private strategy. That is, private infrastructure owners could benefit it's in their interest to, met, to manage it as it comes in the long run, because they don't know where the future private market, that, where the market values are going to come from. Uh, but I think there's too much at stake in terms of social value uh, and social option value of the internet to bet on private and public interests coincide. So uh, in the book, I, think, I argue in favor of a rule that prohibits broadband internet access providers from discriminating based on the identity of the user or use of the handling of packets. It's a pretty simple formulation of a rule. It may seem overly strong. Okay? It, 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 it may seem to rule out a significant range of activities that you might label as reasonable network management. It's a term of art in the United States in the, in the FCC rule. Now, I think it just depends on what, how, what that term turns out to mean. 
The rule that I'm proposing primarily precludes certain forms of fine-grained price discrimination, following discrimination, and prioritization. It doesn't pro prohibit more efficient methods for managing congestion, such as usage-sensitive or congestion pricing. Those things are not identity-based. The proposed rule effectively functions as a social option, which makes economic sense because of the systematic and persistent uncertainty about future sources of both market and social value. And it precludes premature optimization uh, by network owners. It supports experimentation by users. And I think it increases the range of potential value-creating activities, leaving room for unforeseen innovations in markets and value-creating activities to emerge over time. Now, disabling identity-based discrimination or prioritization is not necessarily costless. That's not my claim. But again, I don't think you should assume, as the debate often does, as the participants in the debate often do, I should say, you should not assume that it's costly either. Okay? So the two principal advantages or potential advantages of uh, price discrimination or prioritization are increased output and thus uh, reduced deadweight losses when you compare it to uniform pricing. And the second is increased profit that profits infrastructure providers so you can improve incentives to invest. And I go through this in the book, I won't belabor the point too much here. Neither of these potential advantages appears to be nearly as significant as claimed uh, by participants in the network neutrality debate. Often the claims are just made without theory or empirical support. Okay. Um, in addition, opponents of network neutrality often suggest that identity-based discrimination or prioritization is an efficient way to manage traffic. Right? In particular, managing congestion or managing unlawful, hazardous, or harmful traffic. To be frank, neither of these arguments are terribly convincing either once you evaluate them carefully. There are plenty, plenty of effective means for dealing with congestion that do not involve discrimination or prioritization. And perversely, permitting prioritization of discrimination may encourage infrastructure owners to maintain a state of persistent congestion. It's more profitable. Okay. Similarly, managing unlawful, hazardous, or otherwise harmful traffic can often be handled from the ends without discrimination by infrastructure providers. Oh, although I mean, it hasn't been proven that that can be done. But in special circumstances where it turns out not to be the case, then narrowly crafted exceptions, like, like the police officer on the highway, uh, uh, arguably make much more sense than tolerating broad reasonable, reasonableness exceptions. Okay. Infrastructure analysis with its focus on demand side issues and the function of commons management, I think, reframes the network neutrality debate in a useful way. It adds a weight on the scale in favor of sustaining end-to-end -end architecture and open infrastructure. It points to a particular rule. And it encourages a comparative analysis of various solutions to congestion and other supply side problems. So I acknowledge that there are competing considerations and interests to balance. I'm not, I'm not claiming that I've slam dunk won the debate with this argument. There are competing arguments. You have to figure it out. Uh, and I acknowledge that measuring the weight on the scale is difficult, if not impossible. Nonetheless, I maintain that the weight is substantial and we need to start paying attention to it. Okay? Uh, the social value attributable to a mixed internet infrastructure that supports public, private, and social goods is immense, even if immeasurable. The basic capabilities that the infrastructure provides, the public and social goods produced by users, and the transformations occurring on and off the network are all indicative of such value. Thanks.